This is Carmen Battalion. With me is uh, Kathy Steen and Don Jones. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the 1968 National and all that can be rem remembered about it. Well, hopefully we will remember uh, some things about it, maybe a few dogs and a few people. We were at the uh, St. Joseph High School in Ramapo. That reminds me of Vidalia and Heihara for some reason. But in Ramapo, New Jersey, and Kathy Steen's a native of that area. Well, I was a member of the Northern New Jersey German Shepherd Dog Club at the time the show was put on. And uh, remember very, very much the, the whole show. And uh, it was outdoors on the St. Joseph's High School football field. And believe it or not, we sat on bleachers for two days. The show was only two days in those days. And uh, this being the largest entry that we ever had, it was necessary to call in a fourth judge. And you'll notice when you go through this film that the judges judged a different series of dogs in those days than they do presently. Maybe Don can tell you, tell you a little bit about the judges. Well, the classes were divided, uh, not one... Uh, the same judge didn't judge all the dogs, for example. Uh, they uh, put the overloads off on the uh, fourth judge. Intersex at this show was judged by uh, Ernie Loeb, and he then did some of the class dogs, too. Well, I think he did the class dogs, Don, because of the overload. But in those days, the intersex judge judged the futurity maturity finals, uh, not as is done today. We've changed that since because some of the futurity maturity dogs would be in specials, and we didn't want the judge today to have the, to judge the same dog twice and, and be, be predispositioned to uh, judging uh, a dog at that way. Mary Southcott was the judge who was brought in to do all the novice classes, and I remember that very, very much so because there were 84 novice dogs in that class, and, and my dog, Gail Wins Eilert, won the class. And, and uh, I can tell you something very interesting about that when we get to the class, as far as handlers and so forth. Mary Southcott, you will notice she had a little different uh, a procedure for judging, one that I wouldn't uh, recommend necessarily. She would approach the dogs and squat it down by the side of them and use some of her technique like she was uh, measuring and uh, using her hands to figure out distances and angles and so forth. I also showed in this uh, show, I showed the dog myself for bred by exhibitor class. I do not uh, recall where I was. I can tell you I was not one, two, three, or four, but I did not get sent out with the early ones either. Uh, when I looked, I saw one quick shot of, uh, of me standing in the ring with the dog, but everything went so fast I lost it and don't know what happened. I guess, Don, we ought to probably tell the audience out there that the film uh, converted to video uh, is not the best in the world, but that's the best quality the film was in after all these years. Well, we had some light problems there because a lot of the uh, judging was done uh, at night after dark in the football field. Your lights were on, but those don't always give you the best situation for uh, filming. It was, it's interesting seeing some of the people who, whose names you'll see on the screen. For instance, uh, Ted Beckhardt, the same Ted Beckhardt you now know as a member of the, the German Shepherd Dog Club America Parent Club Board. And he was the president at the time of the Northern New Jersey uh, Club, and Blanche Beiswanger, our secretary, was the show chairman. Look at the entries we had then, 243 obedience. That's a tremendous amount of, of dogs in obedience. But interestingly enough, the passing freight of great dogs had only seven dogs there. And when you see how many were present, they were, they were many fewer, maybe four dogs were present. Today, we have 11 or 12 or 15 of them sometimes at our nationals. So, you know, you'll, you'll notice a, a tremendous change, though, also in the sizes of the classes. My goodness, we had such huge puppy classes back in those days, too. We are more inclined to be a little nostalgic now than we were then. The attitudes were a little different about showing dogs. There was a lot more uh, attitude of this... Uh, hardness of the dog and the constant working and moving of the dog. See, Nick Kay, uh, whose name is on the screen there, is, uh, was a German Shepherd dog fancier. He's a judge who uh, many of you uh, see today. He judges uh, confirmation and obedience today. At all breed shows, mostly, too, you know? Uh, 
he's very well known as an all great judge. You know, this is an interesting thing. Uh, many of us have never seen tracking. And I found this portion of the film extremely interesting because usually tracking at our national is held away from the showgrounds. We never get a chance to really see what tracking is like. And so this portion of the film will give all of you who, who view this film a very good idea of just what a tracking dog does. And they're out of a long lead uh, as this dog is right here. That's uh, one of the uh, fortunate things about finding a location like we are going to have in Perry, Georgia, would be having all of the activities uh, in one area so that the fancy can get there and see um, the tracking, the herding, and all the aspects of the show. Uh, Kat is right. Always before, the tracking is done uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, 40 miles away somewhere, and uh, no one ever got to see it. She's, There's nobody here to see what's going on right now. It's just a handler and a dog and a judge. They certainly were good working dogs in this in this film, though. They, they thoroughly enjoyed their work on a whole. I don't know about this one, but the other one uh, seems to thoroughly enjoy it, and the ones uh, following this were bouncy dogs and uh, really up on this whole thing. Well, this is a, a part of the show that's so important. It shows what the dogs can do uh, with their own brains. Well, a dog had to be a pretty good dog uh, then, and has to be a pretty good dog today to, uh, to make it in tracking. Uh, the dog uh, has no double handler out there. He has no help. He simply has his nose, and, and at the end of a long lead, uh, his handler. He either gets it right or he doesn't. That really measures the uh, versatility and the quality of the dog, and I think this is, a, this is something that I wish we could capture on film at our own uh, current specialty. I don't know whether most people realize it, but we do place a limit on the number of dogs that can be shown in our, in our dog shows, in our national for tracking, because there is a limit as to how many dogs a tracking judge can judge in a day's time, and it does take two, two judges to judge the, the dogs, and it takes a tremendous amount of acreage. Uh, something like 50 acres, I believe, now I, I'm not uh, precisely sure, but I believe something like 50 acres for TDX, which is why we have very few shows in the country for TDX dogs. Well, here we are with the men's team in obedience. Being the, the lady that I am, and I will say, this, they were very, very well presented, but the ladies' team, girls, goes on to win the show. But these Well, we're going to see that in a minute. We'll let everybody see that for themselves. How many of these people do you recognize? You know, I don't know a soul. I, I tried looking at this film last night, and I viewed it, and seeing, you know, did I recognize any? Do you recognize anybody? I did not reckon, recognize a person uh, there, and that's unusual because I'd been around long enough to know most folks in those days. Well, that certainly is a good uh, good acting team there. They, uh, they're moving in somewhat good precision, and it looks like uh, they certainly are competitive, whether or not they win. Well, as we already know, the uh, ladies' team was declared the uh, winner, and we'll see some of that uh, precision work uh, here. I remember being there to see the whole affair and was impressed with this, and I do not know any of these people. Do you know the, any no, of the ladies? I don't know a person, but I have to say, isn't it wonderful to see how these dogs have worked so well together, uh, off lead, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just tremendous to watch this. I don't think we'd probably do enough of this today. Well, one of the things you want to notice about a working dog is the attitude it has while it's working. It's not, uh, its ears are not back, it's not saggy and unhappy looking. It's going to be uh, happy and with an attitude that's bright and cheerful, like, well, I'm happy to be here and enjoy doing this. This was fun watching them all come one by one back to their, to their owners or handlers. Uh, Heidi Van Zook, by the way, I remember that name. She won a number of times the obedience of Victrix title. She, uh, I know uh, that she was uh, the Victrix uh, at least three times, I believe. Name I know well because I saw her uh, get that title at least twice. I don't recognize this trophy. Do you, Don? Do not, and it must have uh, 
someone must have retired it, and it's probably not uh, a breed trophy. Those uh, little name tags on there indicate a, a winner. This Gus Schneider was one Schindler. of the Schindler, excuse me. And who did I come up with Schneider? Oh, Gus no. Schindler was one of the uh, more entertaining people in German Shepherd Dogs. I once heard a handler say, well, let's have a show and have Gus come and be the after-dinner speaker and get somebody else to judge. This Joe Harry was in second there, did you see him? Here we go. Let's see if we recognize anybody else going around here. So far, it's hard to see from here. He moves them a great deal. And he's, uh, and they, and at this time, they still had the attitude to, uh, there is uh, the man from California who owned the Bodo dog. Eric Renner. Eric Renner. Was in fourth that, place at this particular That's right. Dog. The man with the black sweater on with, didn't have a tie on. Eric is a trainer for a, a leader dog school in uh, California and owned a very prominent import dog called Bodo von Leerberg, I believe. Yes, well, it's interesting to see, uh, trying to pick out some of the people from the old days. Uh, of course, people have changed in their appearance, uh, a little less pot, a little more hair, darker color hair. Um, a movement uh, a little more efficient in those days, going around the ring. You're going to recognize a couple of ring stewards here that still appear in the ring at the National today. I saw Marietta in this one somewhere as I was reviewing it. The, the photographer here is still going around taking pictures. It's Steve Klein. Uh, does mostly all breed shows now. Tall, skinny, Steve Klein. Now, this is Don Keeley. As you can tell, 1968 to 1992 has taken the toll on all of us. Yeah, but he's still the big husky guy that he was back then. Just a little more, a uh, little more tomb and a little less hair, maybe. The next class is going to, what was that, 9 to 12 puppies? 9 to 12, yeah. Now notice how Gus does this. He uh, does a very quick examination. He also makes notes and puts them in his pocket. You know this? I, I have no that. idea who this fellow is. I was trying to think last night who he could be. Mr. Schindler was an after-dinner speaker at the St. Louis National in the early 60s, and I will never forget him because he was such a wonderful, wonderful speaker, and he was very colorful. Great sense of humor, uh, constantly uh, keeping an, an audience roaring with laughter. Well, he's just checking coming and going here, and uh, this is... You know, I think this might be Ken Rayner. He always wore white shoes. It no, could be. It could be. Uh, I'm not sure about that. No, maybe not. Look at him coming on. No, it is not. No. no. Okay. It's more like the uh, guy from California. Jack LaRue. Jack LaRue. You notice, people, we're just reminiscing here, uh, just talking, so this is a very natural uh, conversation we're having. Uh, this is Lamar. That's Lamar Coons, that's right. If we say a name that is not correct, that's, that's the way it is, because we're just uh, you know, rambling I'm around. I'm trying to figure out who this woman is, and I just for the life of me can't figure out. And she, had, she had quite a nice dog, and I think she won the class. Is this Walter Frost? It looks like Walter Frost, with the glasses on right yeah. there. We just passed him. Yeah. There's Gloria Birch. Yeah. Gloria has changed least of all. Yes, she has. Now, Kathy's in there, too. Uh, not in this class, but later on you'll see her, and she has dark hair. Well, most of us had dark <laughs> hair and a lot of hair back in those days. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I had dark hair. Mine's a little bit lighter now. <laughs> Oh, I remember Kathy well with the very dark hair. No, not that one. Trim and attractive <laughs> and a violinist. A very high-level professional musician as well. There's Marietta going across there. Now, 
right here is Mr. Love doing intersex, uh, the intersex judge. Look how much thinner he is here. Um, but he judged the puppies because of the overload. He was not originally scheduled to do puppies. I don't remember uh, whether I recognize anybody in this class from the earlier viewing we did. Maybe uh, we'll see somebody as they go around here. Notice that he uh, has the handler show the mouth always. Some of the other judges did uh, their own examination of a mouth. I don't recognize this person either. You know, it's so nice today to, to see our current uh, videos, but we have the name on the screen, uh, the voice comes up and tells you who the dog is, and a little bit about what's going on out there. And uh, it certainly is, a, is an improvement over um, the past, because as you can see here, without the catalog and without the identification and close-up shots of the dog, there's probably a lot of interesting and... There's Doug Crane. There was, Doug went by there for a minute. Yeah, so that, uh, you know, we, you, you can't do today to an old film 20 years ago what we can do uh, for the technology we have when we shoot it live. Well, I have There's to say, Doug. I did look for the catalog to see if I could come up with uh, these people, the dogs and the winners of the classes, and I just couldn't find it. Call Ted Beckhart, too, who was the photographer here, and he has a catalog but it's not marked. I don't know what happened to mine. Well, someone out there probably is going to see this and say, gosh, you know, I've got a marked catalog, but unfortunately it'll be too late. Well, maybe we can redo it. <laughs> I don't even suggest that. There's Jimmy Moses in front of you, that kid. Now you don't remember. There's Marietta standing there checking people in. That I'm not uh, sure about any of those people there. Well, there's the winner, and I don't know who that is. I have not the faintest idea. Yeah. What did you think you would recognize the winner? The, the 1968 is a long time ago. Yes, I guess so. 24, 25, <laughs> 25 years ago. I'm beginning to get some uh, shadows here. We don't have the, the light that we've had in some of the other classes. Now, Mr. Loeb moves them up while he's going around the ring. It's just a little bunching up now and then, but he has a it's a better system of control than most judges do uh, in this kind of judging situation. But, but Don, you know, the AKC has now eliminated the, the ability to do this. A judge can't make a flying move like that like they used to. You have to stop the class and then make your movements. Those days was very exciting to see the judge moving. The people would race to catch up to the front of the line. And, you know, the dog really would put on quite a show doing that. What was exciting to some few people was a very big problem to a lot of other people. That's Don Keeley there moving the dog. Uh, people got uh, left out, run over, pushed aside, and all kinds of scrambling took place. This looks like Walter Frost again, I'm not sure. Yes, sure does. But the fi by far better system, uh, that looks like Eleanor Wilming's daughter. I'm not sure that it is she. That's the kind of stride she had. Well, Tana Maltz-Kira was a beautiful bitch. Uh, I Ken Rayner. Ken Rayner was the handler. Ken Rayner Sr., uh, Chipper's dad. Uh, I remember putting up uh, Kira for some points later on, and she became a very, very uh, big winner in the Northeast as a special. The trademark of Ken Rayner Sr. was he always wore those white socks. Well, here's where I mentioned before that the, the intersex judge futurity and maturity finals. And uh, as today, we don't do that at all. In fact, uh, we, we changed our procedures so that the uh, dog judge judges the bitches. Again, so that... Uh, that was Jim Norris that you just saw. Conflict. 
at all. Pretty stable. And this could be Jack LaRue again. Looks like him a little bit. Yes, it is he. That is he. Whether the other one was or not, I'm not sure. Somebody used to wear white pants all the time. Jim Hedge? I don't think This is Jimmy Moses. Just just went by. Yeah. Doug Crane. I have no idea who he's showing. That's Dorothy Lynn, could that be Dorothy Lynn? Too tall for Dorothy Lynn. Yeah. Look like Joan Fox. That's Joan Fox right there. Yeah. That is Joan Fox with the up 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 hair. There's Jimmy Moses standing there. And he must have been uh, not even twenty five when that shot was made. Is that Jack, Jack Ogren. Like. Yeah, he showed a few dogs in those days. Oh, he yeah. had the touches of gray That's on his hair. One of the one of the more mature handlers in those days. She uh, had already passed 40, 40, in other words. That's Eric Renner. Eric Renner again. You know that one? No, I don't. Well, the Klaus Heidi, you know that the Klaus Heidi was from the Atlanta area, John. Yes, yeah, Frank and Bobby Klaus, uh, bred her. Unfortunately, both Bobby and Frank are deceased. But she was the uh, Grand Victrix uh, in '69, the year following this. I think she placed like uh, second or third. This is Mary Southcott judging, and I told you her procedure was a little unusual. She's a Canadian lady, but an American Kennel Club judge of obedience and German Shepherd dogs. She was a formerly a handler too, Don, so this may be, you know, her getting into the act, how wanting to still have her hands on the dog, so to speak. Well, I remember this class very clearly because my dog won it. And he was sired by um, a dog that we had imported called Earl von Octal, who was the son of Clodo Astor and Mitten Klaus, who you'll see later on in the Parade of Greats. I remember Clodo's uh, owner used to sort of wear him around like a stole. She, she, she uh, had that dog with her in the bleachers everywhere she moved. Well, he was a wonderful dog, and she did show him, I believe it was her, and, uh, who showed him in the parade of greats here. But I have to tell you an interesting thing in those days. Uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Wiles, who is now also deceased, showed the alert for, for me. and. His handling fee, believe it or not, including expenses, because he did show dogs in the old breed world in those days, was $25. Now, eat your heart out, people. Pay $25 to have a dog shown and win the novice class of 84 at the National. Well, a cup of coffee was still a dime, probably. But that that's just indicates to you the changes that have taken place in the, in the sport and in everything that we do. You know, but, but the, the normal handling fee at those days was $15 for a puppy class and uh, 25 or $30 for a class dog. And uh, I would imagine a national in those days, most handlers who were special to him was probably charged about $50. You see what I mean about her taking measurements, how she gets down there, lays her pad down on the ground, doesn't hesitate for a minute to pull up her skirt. That's Eilert. Billy Lyles was a very good handler, a professional handler for a number of years. The other breed he showed a great deal was Afghans. Uh, I guess that was the last breed he had. He died about uh, a year or two ago with a uh, serious uh, heart condition with some other complications. I remember Mary took a very long time judging uh, these dogs and took the entire Friday to judge the novice dog in the novice bitch class. But she, she made it difficult for me to watch her judge because her procedure was a little bit erratic. Looks like it's getting dark out there already, so this must have been a long show. It was. Well, you just figure 1,100 and some dogs being judged in two days. 
in those days, all outdoors. At night, it got so cold you couldn't believe it. During the day, it was pretty warm. It was uh, the time of the year in, in October when the um, nights really cooled down in northern New Jersey at that time, but it could be very warm during the day. But she started her judging at 8 o'clock in the morning, and here it is dark, and she's still doing the novice classes, so you know she gated those dogs. Well, there's the unfortunate thing about some of the judging procedures was not all of the time was spent efficiently. Dogs were doing things it was not, that she was not looking at. This is true in a lot of that slow judging. I saw a, jur a judge do s average six dogs an hour one day, and he didn't know what he was doing, or, or he wouldn't have done that. But the, she, she, was, she did a good job in general, but she was that's very... Like, that's why I learned that. She had to do a good job. I learned one. But she well, was... You're right. <laughs> she was uh, sort of inefficient. Uh, dogs were doing things that she wasn't seeing, and she had dogs going around the ring while she was doing something else, and all those kinds of things. But, Don, in those days, the audience loved the show, and dogs were gated and gated and gated and gated. Well, they were gated to death, but I, have, I can tell you for sure that all of the handlers and exhibitors now would have uh, walked out of the ring with this kind of show. They wouldn't tolerate this kind of thing that we had at this particular national. Now we've gotten to Marie Leary. Those of you who do not remember that name, this was one of the uh, great ladies it's of dogs. Yeah, that's Kathy Pottle. Uh, that's Kathy. Great ladies of dogs. She judged uh, other breeds and uh, got around a good bit. She lived up in Connecticut, among other things. She trained her dogs to live together, and they used to perform uh, in her yard. Ted Michaels. She would keep uh, several dogs in the house together, males uh, together, and things like that. You know, uh, Don, the stories have always been told, and I did see it happen already, where Marie Leary would walk on the showgrounds with all of her dogs off lead, completely under control. And uh, this is the way she brought her dogs up. They lived in the house, ate uh, in the dining room where she did, uh, but always were very, very much under control. Well, in the dining room, she had people in to have dinner. They would, the dogs would sit over against the wall and stay in place. And then at the end of the meal, uh, any guest who wanted to could give a, the, the dog a tidbit or something like that. They were uh, very well trained. But that's true, she brought groups of dogs out off lead and they did what they were told, very orderly, well-trained dogs. But there was the time that she took a dog to the garden where she had to walk around with a muzzle on the dog. That's the one that she imported. Uh, Marie owned uh, the very famous kennel called Casalta Kennel from Greenwich, Connecticut. And she and um, our Rancho San Miguel and uh, what was the other kennel out in California? Um, Inter did a lot of breeding uh, with each other's dogs and saw that their, their bloodlines were very mixed, like Kirkus and Miguel. Um, what, and all these dogs went back to each other's breeding. Marie Leary spent a good part of the year out, and she had a home in California, too. You know, we have a nice uh, videotape, uh, a film conversion called Marie Leary, which uh, tells his story. Uh, George Collins. Yeah, there he is. But the, uh, the Marie, if anyone's interested in Marie Leary, you might want to see that uh, that film because it's narrated by Jane Bennett, who is a close friend of hers, and uh, she gives you the whole story about Marie. Marie was a big benefactor of the German Shepherd Dog Club of America. She left a large bequest uh, to the club to, to be used for uh, this conversion, the one that we're looking at now, and for other educational activities of the club. One interesting story about her, I knew her fairly well. She was a a neat lady. She had a lion, I believe it was a female, on her place there. It's in the state in Connecticut. And the, the lioness and the dogs used to uh, be out together. I remember a, uh, a time whenever she, uh, there was a, like a little low place out in the field near her home. And she told one of the dogs to stay in the low place so that Elsa the lion wouldn't get any, things like that. They, the dogs uh, almost talked to her. They were so well trained. She also is the lady who uh, created quite a controversy by putting down a large number of dogs when she discovered hip dysplasia. Well, that was a tremendous, uh, it was Echo Adams Morgan was second, owned by Fred Migliore. Uh, 
I'm sure that uh, many of you have Morgan in your dog's pedigree back to <laughs> Paladin and, and all of that. Um, Marie Leary was, uh, became very controversial for a while in, within the parent club because of her stand on hip dysplasia and her feeling that all dogs should be x-rayed. Uh, there was a time when, when it was a really a big uproar. She did a lot of work with um, Gary Schnelly in the early days whenever he first discovered hip dysplasia. Of course, Marie was the kind that she was believed so firmly in what she was doing. She took the, a young dog that was dysplastic to the vet and had it put to sleep and stood there and wept bitterly the whole time this was going on. But she felt that she had to do that. And she always wore that beret, by the way. That was her trademark. And, and I have to say, Marie Leary wrote a marvelous little book that when I started raising litters of puppies, I followed it very carefully. She had a, a blow-by-blow -blow description of, of the breeding of the dog, the whelping of the litter, the feeding of the puppies, the weight they should be at various stages. It was a tremendously wonderful guide for anyone who was new in the breed or even old in a breed to, to watch, to read this. Well, we passed my class right up, and I did not catch a view. Well, we just, this is the American bread, and she must have done the bread by exhibitor first. I don't think it was done. No, I saw part of the bread by on an earlier viewing of this. This was Jim Head, uh, as a handler, and uh, the, the s typically of uh, all pictures with Marie Larry, she always posed exactly the same. But she was known on an occasion uh, later on to uh, sit in a chair in the ring and judge the class, at least part of it. Dogs would come up to her. She would examine them at the chair. Of course, AKC wouldn't well, <laughs> would allow that today. Well, but they may not have allowed it then, but uh, you've got to understand, Marie, she was somewhat above that sort of stuff. She, she did what she wanted to. There were many, many very, very wealthy people involved with German Shepherds in those days, and they were a very colorful group of people. Uh, Marie Leary coming from a very, very extremely wealthy family. Uh, another person at the time was Adele Colgate from Colgate Polymer Peat Company, uh, the Coles from Dornball Kennel. So a lot of these people... Uh, they, had, they had unlimited amounts of money, yes. really. Yeah. Well, that looks like Eric Renner in front. It is. And is that Jimmy Moses? Right behind him there. There's Jim Norris coming around. Here comes another one. That's Jimmy Moses. Still, that style of handling he still uses today. Lamar. Who? You think so? I'm not sure. I thought last time. This must be uh, Gloria. Gloria. reminded you of Dave Rinke, but I don't think Dave is there no, I don't think so. in those days. Well, it looks like you had a nice crowd. If you look at the numbers of people there, uh, it certainly would indicate that uh, even then the show was well uh, supported. Now, all four of these dogs finished the championships. Uh, the four open dogs, uh, Alpha Mutzenfeld was owned by, uh, and show, shown by Lamar Coons. He was owned by a man from Reading, Pennsylvania, by the name of Al Zimmer. And uh, the next dog was handled by um, Eric Renner. And uh, Sonny B was from California and went on to finish his championship. Gauss from Stout Park, I think, was owned by Tom and Phoebe Ballard. Right. It was really uh, racking my brain to remember all of this. Marie Leary was a very good judge. She was uh, methodical, efficient. Uh, she did not ever get caught up into s judging a single element. Well, of Lamar a dog. is doing just the same as he always did. Watch him having the owners uh, double the dog. Look at him. He gets his 
shaking his head. That was a very typical Lamar Coons uh, thing to happen when he was setting up the dog, trying to get the best picture he could. But the dogs were not double handled in the same way that they are now. That was more or less for a picture there. This Sonny B's Enoch was a big sable dog uh, who went reserved here at the National Handle by Eric Renner, as I mentioned. Did Eric own that dog? No, he was owned by, uh, and I can see her right in front of me, a tall lady from California who used to show the dog herself sometimes. I mean, Marie was very good uh, with her processes. She got a balanced dog. She looked at all elements and weighed everything uh, well. You didn't come up with a dog that just moved well. You came up with a dog that was good breed type, had all of its parts correct, and moved well, too. Now this is a very a good moving dog for that particular time going around the ring. Notice that the dog is not digging and clawing, it's going around rather easily, as it would in Marie's class. We're back into the sunshine again here. That's Eric Winner with his first place. I wish that we had a catalog here to talk about the bloodlines behind some of these dogs because I think it would be interesting for people who are fairly new to the breed to be able to see uh, what dogs were behind their dogs, what they look like. Here we are back to Mary Southcott judging the novice bitch class. And as I said, this took all day long for her to do the two novice classes. And it's going to be difficult to identify people because of the light here. And I can't believe that at this point it was dark already. I think this must be the filming. Don't you think so, Don? It must be. There is some indication there's light. There's light. There, we come up to this shot and we have some light. Somebody's well, taking a break. <laughs> I guess it's so long they had to take a snooze. That looked like Tommy Beckhart sitting there on the left. Some of these classes were so slow that uh, it got rather boring for uh, people. They did find other things to do. Well, 80, uh, even though 84 dogs in the class was a large number, there were still a few absentees, not too many in those days. But my goodness, that was a long time to judge all day long. If you just say there were 80 present, and you divided that by eight hours. She spent eight hours in that class, didn't she? Well, no, she did novice dogs and bitches. So I'm talking about 160 dogs uh, together, maybe 150 present that she spent more like eight 100. in the morning until uh, maybe six or seven at night. I remember it being a full day's job, but I'm sure that there were only, there were less than 150 dogs altogether. A lot of absentees at this particular show. Maybe not in comparison to what uh, we have today, but there were many absentees. Who was that real tall fellow with the green shirt? You know? Well, I started to say, I wonder if it was Charlie Williams, but I don't believe Charlie's t quite that tall. It does remind you of him a little, though. Is that Harry Snyder? No. Well, I do believe Harry Snyder was handling at this show. It seems to me I picked him out while viewing the figure in this film. Mary in one of her poses. She was a good handler in her day, too, though. She used to show for a well-known lady up in Connecticut by the name of Marion McDermott. Serego. Mary McDermott, Serego. Now there's a long down and back, two dogs together. I don't know if you can really look at two dogs together, that down and back. We don't see much of that today anymore. Well, if you, the first the distance away, you know, that's more of her time consuming things. You know. The distance away from her, you are sending two together, whether you can, push, as long as she can tell, she knew what she was looking for. 
We did have some colorful judges in those days, though, Don, and, and a lot of it was done for ringside. And even though she took forever, people found her judging exciting because she gated a tremendous amount. And the dog that finally won the class won not only an endurance race, but really pulled out and, and uh, could race around like mad. But I have to say, now this first bitch and the second bitch both finished. I remember, I don't know about the other ones, but I remember the first two bitches finishing their championship. Well, back then, uh, most of the dogs that got uh, into the final cuts of the uh, National were easily finishable. Uh, the dogs that came to the National on the whole probably had uh, sort of per capita higher, higher quality. People take, uh, maybe they take dogs to shows now just to take an entry where then they only took uh, what they thought were the, their better ones. Do you think that's true today that the uh, the dogs that are brought to the National are the, uh, the better dogs in the breed or are they just people interested in going to a National so they take their dog? I think it's both. Uh, because I, there's Harry Schneider in the white jacket, wasn't it? I, I do say that years ago uh, more people showed their own dogs at the National. I mean, you saw people like the Collins, the Snyders, they were always showing their own dogs. Yeah, but then the Collinses were handlers, and so was Harry Schneider. They showed uh, Joan Fox. This Joan Fox with the hair up over her head. She show her own dogs a lot. Well, I think what that really says is when all of these folks were younger, more athletic, had uh, better knees than they have today, they could do it. But <clears throat> if those uh, people were young today, uh, do you think they would show their own dogs? I think we had more young Probably. people interested in the breed in those days, too. You know, that's uh, we are sorely in need of new people to come through and take over the breed for us. I have to say, I think the monetary situation today also has entered into this. Certainly, it's much more costly showing and, and raising uh, puppies than it used to be. Um, the feeling by more and more people that they need a handler to show their dogs, um, all of us involved makes a difference. James Moses again, I believe. Handler to show their dogs. Um, all of us involved makes a difference. James Moses again, I believe. Don't know who that is. Nice answer. Yes, she handles it well, too. Is that Doug Crane there? Just my the red jacket, I Jack Ogren, yeah. There he is again. He's telling him to slow down. I don't know any of those dogs. That was Marietta. I, I don't know how many years Marietta's been stewarding, but it's a long time. I, I don't ever remember a national that I was stewarding. But here we are to the open bitch class, and we were 63 in that class. Now, the winner of the open bitch class was a lovely bitch. I believe she was sired by Champion Burns and Callan Garden. And she, uh, when you get to it, you'll see Fred Olson is her handler. And she is, I think, at that time, was absolutely the best that we had. She was gorgeous in breed type and in movement. Well, didn't she go on to be Grand Victrix also? That's the one. Valterra's Image is her name. Uh, owned and bred by people from the New England States by the name of uh, Joe Jeremiah. How's that for a memory? Well, we both did pretty well with that one. There okay. it is. Valterra's Image. She uh, ran out of the classes. Well, the third one, Dina von Hallmark finished also. Because I put up both the first one and the third one for free. I, uh, as I said, I am confident that uh, 
not just the four that placed, but down the line, all of them finished uh, from this national and from the others. There's, there's a young Freddie. <laughs> Look at the same smile. Fred smiles. Olson. Same smiles always. Distinctly a gentleman and a man of great quality in this breed for many, many years. Red Rock's Gino was his dog, and he that was his start dog. Uh, I bet Ray O'Bee's Angelique was quite a bitch, too. He uh, went grand victor with that dog. Uh, I think he had some help showing the dog, but that was his first dog. See that just a little old novice kid got a great one to start with. Well, there were two, two that finished in, in that Red Rocks Geno letter, his sister, too. And uh, <coughs> his kettle name, by the way, was Red Rock. That's right. That's, that's the first dog he had with that kennel name. But I believe he bought uh, Gino and it started the kennel name by putting it on him. California Some of the bitches looked a little more matronly in those days than they do now. I think now they're a little more rangy. Well, Some of the dogs were a little heavier seem a little lower you to know, the ground. It seems to me they, they showed a lot of bitches after they'd had a litter too. You know, they didn't uh, show them quite as young, I don't believe. Well, they weren't campaigned like they are now. Bodo van Leerberg is the dog I spoke of earlier that uh, he imported this dog. Uh, he had a, a beautiful dog, but he was rather straight up in the forehand. Didn't have much reach at all. He was winner's dog at the National that was in Memphis. The year, yeah, the year before this? Yeah, oh, year. Uh, no, it was before that, Don. It, well, maybe it was. When, when did Lance go Grand Victor? Well, it was, I thought it was 67. Well, then it was 67, and Bodo went to uh, uh, Winner's Dog. Bonnie Berger of Kenrose was one of the uh, great bitches. Uh, she was the mother of the of a Grand Victrix after that, Nan Hall's Donna. And fortunately, uh, no, Nan Hall's Donna went Grand Victrix when she was 18 months old in Dallas, Texas. That looks like Herb Kaiser. No, it's not. No. Well, anyway, Nan Hall's Donna went Grand Victrix at 18 months of age. And uh, she belonged to Hall Keys and Wade Saunders, Wade's a veterinarian. She was coming into season when they were getting ready for the show, and they gave her a very a shot that was given very commonly at that particular time to keep her from coming in season and she never came in season again the rest of her life. I do believe this is Lance of Fran Joe's mother, Frolix Elsa. Of, of, uh, am I right on this one? Yeah. Yes, that's who it is, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. and that's Joe LaRosa with her. Joe has, still looks young, doesn't he, today. Elsa was owned by uh, Ollie Conte, who was uh, Charlotte LaRose's mother. In other words, Joe's handling his mother-in-law's dog. How about that? And for those of you who don't realize that the Fords leased uh, Elsa for the litter that uh, Lance came from. Here's the Clodo Alster and Mitten Klaus uh, that I mentioned before, who was the grandsire of the dog that uh, won the novice class. The this lady was a character. Oh gosh, she yes. <laughs> she lived in she lived in Pennsylvania for part of the year, and then she moved to Mount Dora, Florida. Florida. Yes. She was uh, she was not uh, uh, one of your uh, run of the mill type shepherd people. I'm not quite sure what Kathleen thought I was going to say there for a moment. 
but certainly nothing derogatory. I enjoyed this lady. I used to visit with her. It was one of the few people who did enjoy visiting with her. But she did sort of wear this dog like a stole. Kurt von Bitzkelner was quite a dog. I remember seeing him win points to his championship, and he was, unfortunately, you can't see him here, but he was an outstanding looking dog, uh, bred by Luke Garrity and uh, uh, a group at that time who were breeding dogs together, but owned by a man from uh, northern New Jersey. Uh, forget as his name slips me by at this moment, but he was a wonderfully moving dog. This was a wonderful dog. Pat Clay described him one time as her ideal for a male. He stood like a stallion, and I understood what she meant, and I think she's right, but he was a great dog. This, of course, he's very old here. And, uh, when you saw that dog move, he extended and drove, and his talk about suspension, and you knew that his body was just as limber as could be. It's uh, too bad we can't see that now on this dog. You know, he is an old dog at this time. And I don't know who this a is. This is an obedient dog. Yeah, it's very, a UD very dog. Well, very well trained obedience dog. As I, as I commented before, there were really very few dogs shown in the Parade of Greats. Third is High Delight was a very, very nice bitch. Um, owned by two sisters from Pennsylvania, twins, and Lamar had shown her towards a championship. Carol McCormick was the one's name, you know, I can't remember the other girl's name, the other sister's name. It's, it's uh, interesting to note, and you can understand why, that most of the dogs entered in this show are from the Northeast. We didn't get the interest from all over in the numbers that we do now. Well, Eric came in from California, but he had originally lived in Long Island when he first came over from Germany. But Eric was a professional handler. He showed dogs for other mm -hmm. people. He imported the Bodo dog and owned him himself, though. That's, that's all that's in the Parade of Greats. Interesting, isn't it? But you will see that there were many dogs entered in the veterans class. Twenty were in the veterans class, and that's, that's a lot of dogs. Probably instead of showing them in the Freddie Grace, they showed them and exhibited them. As you know, I believe the rule says they they're not exhibited and shown. Are they not? And they can't be shown. In, they can't be exhibited in the Freddie Grace and also entered in the class. That's correct. Only for exhibition. You know, with such a large. Uh, veteran class, so you have to be seven years or older to be in that class. But the size of the class might indicate that uh, maybe back in 1968, Ernestine won this, wasn't that very prominent? So, yeah, it's well known, that Pearl and that's old, everybody should know her. Interestingly enough, Ernestine uh, was perhaps that's one John of DeHope the, sure. that's John DeHope, it was one of the first Burnwood and Callen Garden uh, daughters, and um, obviously she was named for Ernest Loeb. Her name was Ernestine, and owned uh, by, by Connie Beckhardt and bred by Connie, and went on to be a great producing bitch as well. Well, the all-time great producing bitch. Uh, but was a beautiful thing herself. Oh, my goodness, yes. And, and going back to Ernestine, believe it or not, was uh, Gilligan's Island, Harrigan, all the dogs that are behind so many of our good dogs today. Look, Doug Crane again, one with a colorful coat that went by. So Al Stone back there, at the end, I think. Yeah, I was I was going to mention earlier the uh, uh, the size of the class might indicate the longevity was not as big a problem then as it might be now. Now we have dogs that uh, that are selecting the national, become the grand victor, and by the time they're five and six, they're dead or over the hill. Yeah, they do. They age faster now. Many, the average, I mean, always a, a dog would live to be 12, 13, 14 years old back in those days. They, you just didn't have this uh, dogs dying so, so young as they are now. That looks like, uh, we we'll have to wait again, I'm not sure of that. I thought I saw Jenny Collins, but I know she's in here. A very good handler. You know, they started judging intersex, um, of course, with, with only two days of judging after the lunch hour. 
and with a large class of dogs. Uh, it went on and on and on into the night, and we all sat on the bleachers with the lights that lit up the football field not being the greatest in the world, and you ended up seeing just feet going around in front of you. It was a, a very difficult show for a spectator at that point, and I think one of the reasons that we now have come indoors and have our shows over three days because when it came to the most important part of the show, seeing all of these wonderful champions, we didn't really see them. Well, we have control when we do the show, as we do it now. You have control of everything. You have control of the climate. You have control of the lighting. Also, the shows are, uh, and I don't mean to say that they weren't well managed before, but they're so well managed now. We put on a show uh, the way you have to put one on now. To make it efficient to get through it so all of that helps well technology also helps us uh, the lighting out there today even in the stadiums mm -hmm. outdoor stadiums the lighting uh, in most places today is, is for, te for nighttime television and with that kind of capability uh, even an outdoor show at night would, would look good back in those days 1968 uh, I venture to say there probably wasn't three stadiums in the country that had uh, lights capable of uh, nighttime uh, filming, uh, and that, of course, was even before the uh, video. So, uh, John's you're talking, right. You're talking here to a high school field, too, which certainly wouldn't be as well lit as a professional ballpark would be. It was a private school, too. It was Roman Catholic High School there. But incidentally, we stayed as the headquarters that year at the Marriott at Saddlebrook. I drove from uh, home Atlanta area to uh, New Jersey that year and I remember driving back leaving uh, early the next morning and driving all the way home 16 hours it took me but you know uh, we talk about things too uh, here we are having a show at one exit we had I remember going to the toll booth every day on the Garden State Parkway to get off it was right right near the hotel the Marriott then the Marriott Hotel wasn't, the dining room wasn't large enough to accommodate all of us for dinner, so we had to go to another building for that, too. And, you know, we, we're sort of spoiled uh, with that now, too, I think, don't you? Yeah, we, we do. Uh, well, it's management again. We look for these things now, and we didn't look for them so well then, I guess. I don't have any idea who this is. That's unfortunate that we can't see these folks better than that. Many of these people were... They're fine exhibitors, long-time breeders and things, and we're sort of passing them up, not even mentioning them. Well, how was Grand Victor this year, Don? This was, this was Image. That was the Grand Victor. You no, know, the Grand Victor this year was, uh, was for the second time. Right. Uh, Callas Mike. Now, this is, this is an unusual situation. The dog went up Grand Victor two times. Who judged him the first time? He was Grand Victor both times by Ernie Lowe. He, right. he went Grand Victor in 1966 in uh, Kansas City, and uh, that's Jimmy Moses there now. And then uh, that's the year that uh, Frank and Bobby Cloud's dog, Fritz, went uh, right behind him. And then the next year he wasn't shown, and the show was in Memphis, and Lance went Grand Victor, and then the next year he was shown, and he went Grand Victor again. And well, he should, I thought. One fantastic dog. He was the uh, the son of uh, the great producing dog that Ernie imported, and was just had the same size as Ernie's team, wasn't he? And Valtara's image. They were all sired by Byrne. A blood of a stud dog that maybe could have done more had uh, people learned quicker what he could do. And of course the combinations, the right combinations with him were what made the, uh, the great dogs. Well, I think it's, it's interesting to know that a burned daughter bred to land produced Mannix of Franjo. And the, the combination of burn bred to the Lance lines certainly produced a lot of our better dogs in the country in those days. Byrne had a great deal of substance and was an easy moving dog and uh, very, very rich pigment and uh, passed these things on freely. But 
He uh, burned a, was his attitude was rather laid back and lackadaisical. He did not, uh, he was not easily fired up. He was not uh, very animated, but he was just a solid dog. Yeah, I'm sure that if he had had a little more animation and, and were a little more fired up, he probably would have been a grand victor himself because he was a beautifully moving dog. He just didn't have a lot of pizzazz as far as, you know, that's concerned. You could not in any way stand him there and take him piece by piece and find anything to fault with him um, that I recall. I would say personally he's, he's probably been the most influential of all the German imports in our breed today. Now, uh, we were talking about the influence that uh, Byrne had on the breed and uh, Kathy had indicated that uh, she felt he was one of the most influential. And that is true. Uh, Troll von Richterbach was rather influential, uh, too, and sired many, more, many, many more uh, offspring than Byrne did. Troll sired the F litter of Arbywood, and from that litter came the sire of Lance, who has been so impressionable. But and remember that Lance offspring, a lot of them were bred to Byrne. That that's right, and that's where that's how we got some of the good ones down the line. Absolutely, that it combined the 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 good of both lines and and produced this this wonderfully sub substantial, beautiful moving dog uh, that we would, that came about as a result of that. But we well, don't we're at the end here, of John, and and that's it. So uh, we've done a lot of reminiscing here, and uh, unfortunately. We haven't known all the dogs' names, but uh, hopefully you, you did find the side uh, aspects of this national to be interesting. It should be interesting to newer people who have uh, come into the breed. I certainly enjoy this kind of stuff anyway.